Jeremiah chapter 23. Now, here is the exciting news. I am going to solve a big problem for you that you didn't even know existed. So I am first going to show you what the problem is, what the difficulty is, not just in this text, but in many related texts in the Hebrew Scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament. I'm going to show you what the problem is, and then I'm going to show you the solution, which will then open up some important aspects about Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. This conference is, is a real word-based conference. It's a time to dig into the scriptures together. So I'm going to be in a teaching mode more than a preaching mode. Every so often you're allowed to shout amen or something like that. Uh, there we go. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, though, and then we'll, we'll get into the scriptures. It was 1986, and I've often shared this. Normally, I'll share it in a heavily mixed audience because they get it a lot quicker. But it was 1986. I was preaching in Washington, D.C., a congregation that was basically all black, about 600 people. And I can lecture at seminaries. I'm a, a prof at different seminaries. I can lecture with the best of them. I can write scholarly articles. That when I'm done with them, I don't even understand what I just wrote. But I've always preached very simple messages, and I often preach overseas, so when you're overseas with a translator, you have to be very simple in your sentence structure and vocabulary. So I'm, I'm preaching a typical, simple message in this church, and suddenly somebody shouts out from the congregation, make it plain. And I, I thought to myself, I, I, I don't know how to make it any more plain. I mean, I'm simple. I'm clear, I'm not getting off in some exalted philosophical discourse or using difficult vocabulary or odd sentence structure. I thought, what can I do to make it even more simple? And I'm thinking this as I'm preaching. So I thought, all right, bring it down another level. So I simplify the message even more. And I'm preaching away, and suddenly an elder on the platform shouts out, make it plain. And I thought, I... I don't know how to make it any more plain. I don't know how to be any more simple and clear. And then it dawned on me, oh, that's their way of saying, preach it, brother. Make it plain. Preach it. So it took me a little while to get that. They didn't teach me that at NYU, but I, I figured that out. So uh, I'm going to try to make it plain tonight, but I am going to dig a little deeper, and I believe that's why you're here. So let's dig into the scriptures together. Jeremiah 23 Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you've done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will the, any be missing, declares the Lord. So I, I want you to notice something here, that this is a prophecy. Uh, it is before the full-blown Babylonian exile, but it is a prophecy. Uh, there were already Israelites who were scattered in an exile, there were already some Jews, presumably, who were taken to Babylon, like Daniel and some of the others in the earliest exile from Jerusalem. There was much more to come, though. And God's saying, I'm going to bring judgment on the false shepherds, the, the national leaders who are destroying my people. Beginning in verse 9, it begins to center on the prophets. But these first verses, the kings, the princes, the corrupt leadership, I'm going to bring judgment on them, and I'm going to regather my people. So this is a prophecy of what is going to happen when God regathers the exiles from Babylon. Jerusalem falls in 586 B.C. Jeremiah began ministering in 627. So he's been preaching repentance for over 40 years. Jerusalem has not been listening. The false prophets and the false priests have been leading the people astray. The people have been hardening their hearts. And now judgment comes. Jerusalem is destroyed. Tens of thousands of people exiled. 
And now Jeremiah is saying this is what's going to happen when God restores the exiles. Verse 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch. The Hebrew word for branch there, tzemach, and that occurs in a number of other key messianic passages. A king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the, in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness, or the Lord is our righteousness. So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he's banished them, then they will live in their own land. And notice again, verse 6, in his days... Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. Now, did God bring the exiles back from Babylon as promised, and did he do the things he said he would do once they were restored? Yes and no. Yes, he did bring the exiles back, but it was not in the ways that were prophesied. They did return, and they did rebuild Jerusalem, and normal life was restored just as was prophesied, but there were many other things that were supposed to happen that didn't. Uh, let, me, let me read you a number of other passages. Jeremiah chapter 24, beginning in verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Like these good figs, he had been shown good figs and bad figs. Like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. Did that happen? Yes and no. Did the exiles return from the land as promised? Yes. Was there a spiritual turning among some of them? Yes. Did they all turn to the Lord and serve with one heart? Certainly not. Let's look at another verse. Jeremiah chapter 30, beginning in verse 8. Oh, by the way, I apologize for using so much scripture while preaching the word. Verse 8, again, this is talking about God delivering his people out of the terrors of the destruction of Jerusalem and the pains of exile, Jacob's trouble. Verse 8, in that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, O Israel, declares the Lord. I will save you out of a distant land, out of a distant place, your descendants from the land of their exile. Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. So God says, I'm going to bring you back to the land. I'm going to break the yoke of foreigners off of you. You'll, you'll serve the Messianic king, David, and you'll dwell in peace in the land, and no one will ever make you afraid again. Did it happen? Well, they did come back. And yes, the Messiah was revealed, but did the rest of these things happen? No. Now remember I said, I'm going to create a problem for you before I solve it, and when I solve it, you'll thank me. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 38 to 40, speak of the return from exile and God giving a new covenant to the house of Israel, the house of Judah. That's verses 31 to 34. Then verses 35 to 37. No matter what happens, God is going to keep his promises to Israel and restore his people. Verse 38. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt for me from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. Now remember, they're not thinking thousands of years ahead. They're not thinking what's going to happen in the year 2016. They're thinking when the temple's destroyed and Jeremiah says it's going to be rebuilt in the future, they're thinking when they return, when they return from exile and the temple is rebuilt. 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt for me from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The measuring line will stretch from there straight to the hill of Gareb and then turn to Goa. The whole valley where dead bodies and ashes are thrown and all the terraces out to the Kidron Valley on the east as far as the corner of the horse gate will be holy to the Lord. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. Did that happen? Absolutely yes and absolutely no. Was Jerusalem rebuilt after the exile? Absolutely yes. Was there dancing in the streets again and weddings and children playing and things that are prophesied elsewhere in Jeremiah? Absolutely yes. Was the city never destroyed again? Absolutely no. Are you seeing a pattern here? Are you seeing a consistency here? And you can't say, well, then Jeremiah must have been a false prophet. I mean, obviously you're reading it in the Bible. That tells you he wasn't regarded as a false prophet. But he's the one who said that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and it was. And he's the one that said that the temple would be burned to the ground, and it was. And he's the one that said that the children of Israel were not coming back immediately, that they'd be in exile for seven years, and they were. And he's the one who said they would return from exile, and the temple would re be rebuilt, and it all happened. But then he said other things would happen, and they didn't happen. Did, did his imagination just get the better of him? Mitch introduced me as a Pentecostal Messianic Jew, so I've often prayed for sick people, and sometimes before going to a hospital, especially when I did this more often in years past, before going to a hospital, you know, the doctors and nurses, they're all working so hard to, to bring health and, and recovery to patients, but it's not exactly what you would call a faith-filled environment. I mean, there's a lot of suffering and pain and people dying, and, and, and many of the doctors are realists and pragmatists, and they've often talked to flaky people who are so sure this relative's gonna be healed or that one's gonna be healed, and it doesn't happen. So when you tell the doctor, the Lord told me my uncle is going to live, they may just nod like, mm. because they know, barring divine intervention, the person's going to die in a day, and they don't normally see divine intervention. So sometimes before going to a hospital, I'd have to get my mind and heart in the right place so I could have an attitude of faith as I go to pray. So I'd be praying and meditating and, and just saying, Lord, touch this person, heal them, and my mind would just kind of be racing a little bit. And I just picture myself in that room praying for the person. And next thing, they're healed. And, and, and then there's someone else in the room. And I start talking to them. And, oh, would you pray for me? I pray for them. And they're healed. And, and next thing, my mind just kind of running. And, I, and I'm walking down the hallway with my hands raised. And people are getting healed in every room. It's like, wait, wait, stop, stop. Your, your imagination just got the better of you there. You're, you're exaggerating. Well, is that what happened to Jeremiah? God really showed him something, but his, his imagination ran wild? One of the foremost Old Testament scholars from the late 1800s, early 1900s, S.R. Driver, in his uh, commentary on Jeremiah, that's basically what he says. And I quote him at length in my Jeremiah commentary towards the end of the, the book where he, he lists all the things that Jeremiah prophesied, and you check them off. Yep, 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 just as he said. Happened, 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 literally happened. Yep, 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 yep. Happened, didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. What's his explanation? Jeremiah's imagination ran wild. Obviously, he was a liberal scholar who didn't believe in divine inspiration. But, but we know that's not the case. Jeremiah is as proven a prophet as anyone who ever lived. So how do we deal with with these prophecies of restoration that happen, but only in part. Let me read a couple of other passages to you. Jeremiah chapter 32, beginning in verse 37. We'll start in verse 36. The Lord says, You are saying about this city, by the sword, famine, and plague, it will be handed over to the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will surely gather them from all the lands where I banish them in my furious anger and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in... Is this mic cutting out? 
and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. Did God bring our people back to the land and reestablish us? Yes. Did we as a nation serve him with a single heart? No. Did a remnant turn? Yes. Did the whole nation turn? No. Did he bring back some of the exiles? Yes. Did he bring back all of the exiles? No. Now, here's what's interesting. It's not just Jeremiah who prophesied this. All the prophets who spoke about the return from exile basically had the same kind of prophecies. When Isaiah prophesies about it, it's going to be a new exodus. It's going to be a new creation. It's going to be a greater exodus. It's, it's going to be a, a path in the wilderness, and there'll be streams in the wilderness, and there'll be a highway in the desert, and the exiles will come back rejoicing, and God's kingdom will come to the land. Did it happen? Only in part. What about Ezekiel? Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, is another glorious chapter about the return of the Jewish people from exile. Now remember, Ezekiel was captive in Babylon. He was a priest. He was one of the exiles in Babylon. When God spoke about the return from Babylon, he knew exactly what it was talking about. He, he knew it was not something that was going to happen in thousands of years. He knew this was something that is going to happen when God restores his people. And in Ezekiel 36, God says, I'm not doing it for your sake, but for the sake of my name, because my name is being blasphemed. Wherever you are in the nations, my name is being blasphemed. In other words, God gets a bad rap because it looks like he can't even take care of his own people. The God of Israel is defeated. His temple is destroyed. His people are in exile. Looks like he's not this great God after all. The gods of the nations have won and prevailed. So he said his name was being mocked. That's what it says in Isaiah 52. That's what it says in Ezekiel 36. His name was being mocked by the, by the nations. So he said, I'm going to bring you back. And it's not because of your righteousness. I'm going to bring you back in the land. And then once you're in the land, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. And I'm going to take the stony heart out of you. And I'm going to put a new heart in you. Now remember, when you read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you are reading about the restoration of the exiles back to the land. And there is a seeking of God, and there is a repentance, and there is a going after God. But they are anything but a restored to God community. And both Ezra and Nehemiah have to deal with a plague of intermarriage to the point that, that the kids can't even speak their native language anymore. They're speaking the language of the surrounding peoples. It's anything but a national turning to the Lord. And, and, and when you get a, a century after that, when you get to the book of Malachi, it opens up by, by God saying, I wish someone would just shut the temple doors to stop you from, from burning this meaningless incense. And it, it's a word of repentance to the Levitical priests and, and, and calling for purity in temple service. It's anything but a word of, of praise to a restored community. And then, of course, the temple ends up getting destroyed again in the year 70 and still not rebuilt to this day. How do we explain this? In fact, one of the more enigmatic portions of Scripture is Ezekiel 40 through 48. And in these interesting chapters, it, it speaks of a restored Jerusalem and a restored presence of God and a rebuilt temple with animal sacrifices and, and, and it ends with, with a glorious picture of this, this, this river going out from the temple that brings healing and life wherever it goes, and the, the trees are for the healing of the nations. It's, it's a very famous passage of Scripture. And, and I say it's, it's mysterious, it's, it's interesting, because it seems as if that was expected when the exiles returned. In other words, Ezekiel did not understand that God was showing him a vision of something that was going to happen several thousand years later, something that would happen in what we refer to as a millennial kingdom, something that would happen in traditional Judaism when the Messiah is revealed and builds the, the temple, and this is going to happen in the future. Ezekiel understands this is going to happen when we return from exile. In fact, God says to him, show the plans to your people so they can be ashamed. You know, this is what God has planned. Here we are rotting in exile. This is what God has planned. If we'll only repent and humble ourselves, we'll be restored. 
And, and yet when they rebuilt the temple, they didn't build it according to those specifications, which were different than the dimensions of the tabernacle of Solomon's temple. So how does it all fit? It's prophesied. It was expected then, but it did not happen. And again, I could go through other passages in Ezekiel, and I could go through other passages in Isaiah, and it is the same thing over and over again. And, and I had to really wrestle with this when writing my commentary on Jeremiah because it's such a pervasive theme. Notice, by the way, because this is a chosen people messianic conference, and we are here to instruct and equip and get deeper, that I'm using words like enigmatic. So I'm not making it quite as plain. I'll even use some words. I'm not even sure of the meaning of these words. Just joking. So how do we deal with this? How do we explain this? And aside from the question of what was Jeremiah saying, why should it even matter to us? Why should it matter to us as followers of Jesus the Messiah? This was actually a big one for me when the light went on. So again, I have to, I have to create the problem for you, make you aware of the problem, and then you'll appreciate the solution. When we talk about messianic prophecy, what do traditional Jews tell us all the time? And it's a, it's a good argument. Well, if Jesus is really the Messiah, then why isn't there peace on earth? If this Jesus you talk about is really the Messiah, why has there been such suffering and pain and war since he's been here? If he's really the Messiah, why haven't we beaten our sores into plowshares? Why aren't all the nations streaming into Jerusalem to, 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 to learn the teaching of the Lord? Why aren't these things happening? Why isn't there a glorious temple? Why isn't Jerusalem exalted as the highest place on the earth spiritually? Why has none of this happened if he's really the Messiah? So what's the answer? We tell them, well, there are two phases to the Messiah's work. There is part one and part two. Part one was to come and suffer and die before the temple was destroyed in the year 70 to make atonement for our sins and the sins of the world. And then he'll be rejected by his people. He'll become a light to the nations. And then at the end of the age, he'll return and fulfill the rest of the prophecies. At that time, all these other things will happen and there'll be an era of universal peace and the knowledge of God on the earth. And the traditional Jewish response is, well, that's just a cop-out. Because you're a guy who didn't do it the first time around, you'll say he's going to do it the next time around. And we answer and say, no, there are prophecies that had to be fulfilled before the year 70 when the temple was destroyed, and there are things that he had to do first before he could do the rest. In other words, if, if I prophesy to you that there will be a two-story building built here, and on the second story, all of these amazing shops and and, and, and stores will be open. It's going to be an amazing second floor. And then I build the first floor, and you say, what happened to your building? I thought there were going to be all these amazing things. Yeah, that's on the second floor. First we build the first floor, then we build the second floor. First the Messiah comes and accomplishes his mission and then releases that to the world, and then he'll return at the end of the age to complete it. Well, then a traditional Jew would say, well, what makes you think those prophecies about death and suffering are messianic? What makes you so sure that those prophecies actually speak about the Messiah? Maybe they have nothing to do with the Messiah. And for me, the big answer, and, and the thing that's been so important to contribute to the discussion, is this. And then I'm going to come back to, to these passages we've been reading and put it all together for you, all right? So, I explain that the Messiah, like King David, was a priestly king. He was a king in the order of Melchizedek. He did royal work as a king, but he also did priestly things as a king. You are a priest forever. Psalm 110, after the order of Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest over Salem or over Jerusalem. So, in the same way David was a priestly king, the Messiah is a priestly king. And what do priests do? 
They make atonement for sin. They intercede for the people. So the Messiah fulfills his priestly role by dying for our sins and rising from the dead and making atonement. He fulfills his priestly role by being the substitute for our sins and by making intercession for sinners and taking these things on his own shoulders and bearing our iniquity and fulfilling what the scripture said about priestly ministry and atonement. He himself does that. And that's why you have these prophecies about suffering and death, because they are part of the Messiah's role because he is a priestly Messiah. We're not just saying, yeah, that looks like Jesus. They must be prophecies. Yeah, that's what Yeshua did. They must be prophecies. No, we're saying that the Messiah is not just a king. The Messiah is not just a teacher. The Messiah is also a priest. And traditional Judaism basically has left that aspect behind. The Messiah will come and be a great teacher. And, and, and he will be in the model of one of the great rabbis. And he will also be a great warrior. But they have completely forgotten about his priestly role, which we'll come back to when we bring this to a close. You say, okay, I think I understand what your point is. That there are lots of prophecies about the Messiah, but some came to pass at a certain point, and the others will come to pass later. How do we know that the others will come to pass later? Because the first part happened. Here, tell me who you would trust. Someone says to you, I, I want to buy this office building for your organization. It's a $10 million building. I'm giving you $1 million in cash one month from now, and then I'll be back. It's going to be a while, but I'll be back afterwards. You get in there, you get established, you start paying the mortgage, and I'm going to come back in a while. It's going to be a while, but I'm going to come back and give you the other $9 million, right? Two people tell you that. One of them in a few weeks, at the promised time, comes and gives you that million in cash, says, I'll be back, it'll be a while, but I'll be back. The other guy never shows up and gives you the million. Who would you trust? Obviously, it's been a while. Well, I wonder why that guy hasn't come back yet. But he did give me that million, and he said it was going to be a while. I have every reason to trust he'll do the rest that he promised, but the other guy didn't even show up. So there were prophecies that needed to be fulfilled before the temple was destroyed in the year 70. Right? The only one who can fulfill the rest of the Messianic prophecies is the one who fulfilled the first part. The only one who can complete the mission is the one who started the mission. And if none of those prophecies came to pass before the temple was destroyed in the year 70, then we have no reason to believe any of the rest of them will come to pass. It's just like the guy who said, I'll give you that deposit, and he never showed up. So, are you with me so far? What's that got to do with all of these passages that I looked at? This principle of what's called already and not yet. Or here's the theological term, realized eschatology. Eschatology has to do with the study of, of the end times, a term you're familiar with. And realized means that some of the things have been realized, some of the things have come to pass, but the rest have not. Did the exiles return from Babylon? Yes. Did they return in the numbers expected? No. Did they return and rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple? Yes. Was it rebuilt with the glory that was prophesied? No. Did the people turn to the Lord? Yes, but not in the number and not in the degree that was prophesied. But what we see is this. This is the pattern with prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in the Hebrew Scriptures, that it happens partly and then the rest. So what you have in the days of the Restoration, long after Jeremiah had died, what you have is, yes, the prophecies are being fulfilled, just as he said, but only in part. If, if you could imagine, let's say Jeremiah is sitting in, in, in heaven, and he's able to see what's happening on the earth. And the angels say, Jeremiah, you'll be encouraged to see what's happening. And he sees the exiles returning and thinks, this is wonderful. I can't wait to see the rest of them come back. He's like, wait, wait. That's, I mean, that's part of what happened, but where's the rest? And, and wow, they're rebuilding the temple. That's the temple? Wow, the people are worshiping God. Where are the rest of the people? 
worshiping God. And it would have been the same for Ezekiel. It would have been the same for Isaiah. Now, why is this so big? Because traditional Jews will dispute what we say about the prophecies of the Messiah when we say the first part happened here, the rest would happen here. We know that the rest are going to happen because the first part happened. When they dispute it, my answer is, it's not just Messianic prophecy. It's all these prophecies of the restoration from exile. In fact, many of the Messianic prophecies are pictured against this backdrop. God will restore his people from exile, and the Messiah will be revealed, and it will be a time of peace and safety, and Israel will never be destroyed again. And yes, there was the return from exile, and the temple was rebuilt, and before that temple was destroyed, the Messiah was revealed. And the glory of God was made manifest. And the things he had to do were done. Now, weren't the disciples expecting more? Didn't they think it's all going to happen now? What happens when Yeshua asks Peter and the disciples, who do, you, who do people say that I am? Well, some say this, some say that, some say that. Who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah, son of the living God. Yeshua says to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then he begins to prophesy about, about Peter, about Kepha, the rock. He begins to prophesy about him and his role and the confession of the Messiah. And then from that time on, he begins to talk about how he's going to be beaten and, and handed over to the, to the elders and he's going to be crucified and on the third day rise. And what does Peter say to him? Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. Remember, this is Peter that God revealed things to. Peter that just said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Obviously, you're not going to die. You're the Messiah. Obviously, you're not going to be crucified. You're going to rule and reign. You just confirmed I was right in saying you're the Messiah, Son of the living God. Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord. This will never happen to you. You got the account in Matthew 16 and, and Mark 8 and Luke 9. Never, Lord. This will never happen to you. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. And would you look at this through a totally human carnal lens? I don't get it. And then, remember, after his resurrection, he's with his disciples on and off over a period of 40 days, speaking about the kingdom of God. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they come to him and say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, if you listen to some church commentators over the years, even John Calvin, as brilliant as he was, said that there were more errors in that sentence than there were words. When they said, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus did not say to them, you fools, you idiots, you morons. I've been with you for 40 days after my resurrection, and you still don't get it? Stupid. The church has replaced Israel. Don't you understand that? That's not what he said to them. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Idiots! God's done with Israel. Don't you understand? All the promises are for the church. Oh. No. That's not what happens. He basically says, good question, but not for you to know right now. He says, it's not for you to know the times and seasons the Father set by his own authority. In other words, it's going to happen. It's just not for you to know when. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you'll, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. That's what you need to focus on. But my point is, the disciples thought, okay, so when does it happen? Now you died. You, you died for the sins of the world. You, you were a ransom for, for our souls. Your, your blood was the, initiates the new covenant. Okay, wonderful. So is this it now? Now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And, and even in Acts 3, as Peter's preaching, Inspired by the Spirit, he tells the Jewish people, repent and turn to God that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, that he may send the Messiah. He still understood that, that it was Jewish repentance that would usher in the Messiah's return, and that remains true to this day. As the gospel goes to all the nations and the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, Romans eleven twenty five, 25, that ultimately the turning of Israel, this coincides with the Messiah's return. So my point is that there has always been this expectation, be it with the return of the exiles from, from Babylon and other places where they were scattered, be it with the Messiah coming into the world, there was the expectation it's all going to happen in one chunk. And that's never how it's happened. It has been 
First fruits already, but not yet. It has been the deposit, the down payment, and not the rest. Many times in my own spiritual life, I've experienced this on a small level, and, and maybe you have as well, where the Lord is really speaking to you about something, and you really feel him promising you something and calling you to do something. And when you step out in obedience, he gives you supernatural confirmation and opens the door, and things begin to happen. And funding is there or backing is there, whatever it is, and then you throw yourself into it, and you begin, and you're waiting for everything else to happen, and it doesn't. And sometimes many years go by before the rest of the promise comes to pass. But the God who started the work will finish the work. What that means is that the rest of these prophecies of return from exile are still to be fulfilled. That's why in the last century we have seen a restored Israel. And just like in Ezekiel's prophecies, Jewish people coming back to the land in unbelief. The founders of the modern state of Israel being almost all non-believers, certainly non-believers in Yeshua, often largely non-believers in God. Some of them atheists, some of them communists. And, and in fact, much of the religious Jewish world opposed the modern restoration of Israel because they, they thought it would be a disaster. They thought, no, this is for the Messiah to do. And if, and if we try to do it in our own power, it's going to get in the way of the work of the Messiah, and it's going to stir up world anti-Semitism, and plus it's going to be a secular state, which is the most abominable thing of all, the thing that drove us into exile. And of course, much of what they feared has happened, and yet this is God working sovereignly. He who scattered is the one who is regathering. And, and now the population of Israel, the Jewish population, uh, over 6 million obviously a highly significant number after the Holocaust. And the return from exile continues around the world. And God said to the exiles upon their return, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And we're even seeing that. I mean, the numbers are still small within Israel in terms of Jewish people coming to faith. But, but it's still a, a massive increase over what it's been before. And even with the Six-Day War in 1967 and Jerusalem coming back into Jewish hands, that's also the beginning of what's called the Jesus People Movement, a time when so many of us in Jewish ministry came to faith. And in fact, as we were being driven from the airport last night, our, our driver, Joe Franco, said that we were talking about coming to faith. And I said, when did you come to faith? And he was aware of, of my spiritual birthday. Well, he has the same spiritual birthday, December 17th of 71. I was interviewing another Jewish believer on the radio one time, Howie Morgan, and he's telling his story, and it was December of 71. I said, what, what day is it? December 17th, 71. I mean, there's several of us. It was an amazing time of harvest. It was another first fruits. And that's why I'm confident that at the end of the age, that there will be a massive turning of the Jewish people to the Messiah that there will be a massive turning of religious Jews and others, and they'll be crying out, and they'll look to the one they pierced. I'm confident it's going to happen. Why? Because the first part happened. We have the deposit. We have the down payment. We'll have the rest. So what I'm saying is the prophecies of the return from exile are like a template for the rest of the messianic and restoration prophecies, that they happen in stages. The first part happens as prophesied, but not as big or glorious as expected, but that guarantees that the rest will happen. The exiles returned as scheduled and began to do what was prophesied, but the rest did not happen. That awaits a future fulfillment. The Messiah came as scheduled and did everything he needed to do at that time. Was it on the level expected in terms of numbers, in terms of worldwide impact, in terms of the whole world turning and being a place of peace and righteousness? No, but he did the first part, and the second part will be completed when he returns. And what does that come on the heels of? It comes on the heels of the return of Jewish people from exile around the world and God's restoring work in the land. In that sense, we are living in prophetic days. So the problem that I wanted to create for you was that you've got all these verses that seem to be partly fulfilled, and then they stop. I mean, it's like someone that, that is, is dying of cancer, and they're, they're crippled, and, and, and they can barely even function. They can't even get food in their mouths. And you have a prophetic word. You will live, 
you will be completely well, you will be cancer-free the rest of your life, and you will be so restored that you will run in the New York City Marathon. And the person's healed, and the cancer completely disappears on the person's deathbed, and the doctors are stunned. Everybody's stunned. Everyone says, this is a miracle. We've, this is a documented miracle. We've never seen anything like it. But the person still can't walk. Say, okay, the same God who healed is the God that's going to touch this person's leg. We saw the first part. We'll see the second part. In this case, we're talking of a gap of, of 2,500 years or more. 2,500 years and counting, but we know the rest will happen because the first happened. The exact same thing with the Messiah. Already and not yet. We have the first fruits. The rest will happen when he returns. Oh, and by the way, since it was prophesied of the Messiah that he would be rejected by his people but would then be a light to the nations, we continue to see that growing in fulfillment day by day. So let's come back to one last thing, which is this term semach, branch, referring to the Messiah. Is it a picture of, of weakness and lowliness? Just a twig, just a branch? growing out of a, of, of a root, just a stump. We have the same term used in Isaiah, the fourth chapter, and the second verse, the branch of the Lord would be glorious. And then we have a different term for branch that's used in Isaiah, the 11th chapter, netzer, which many believe is part of the background to Matthew 2 when Matthew says that the prophets, plural, have said he will be called the Nazarene, a play on words, He'll be from Nazareth. He's called a Netzer. Is that the connection there? Many scholars believe so. Is it that he's going to be lowly and despised and outcast? You know, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Is that what the prophets were saying? But here's what's fascinating. Zechariah chapter 3, Joshua, the high priest, who outside of Zechariah is known by another name, which is what? Yeshua. So Joshua, the high priest in Ezra and Nehemiah, is referred to as Yeshua, just for your information. In Joshua 3, there is a reference in verse 8. Listen, O high priest. Zechariah 3, excuse me. Listen, O high priest, Joshua, and your associates seated before you. You are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch, this messianic figure, the servant in the line of David, but somehow connected here with Joshua. Now, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 9. The word of the Lord came to me, take silver and gold from the exiles, and because a list of them who have arrived from Babylon, go the same day to the house of Yoshia, son of Sephania. Take the silver and gold and make a crown. Some texts would say make crowns, but because... It's, it's for one person, and some of the texts read singular. Many read it as singular. Take the silver and gold, make a crown, set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, Yehoshua, son of Jehoshadak. Hang on. Why are you putting a crown on the head of the high priest? Zerubbabel, the governor, was from the line of David. You put the crown on the head of Zerubbabel. There are even some scholars liberal Christian scholars and Jewish scholars who say, yes, this was originally about Zerubbabel, but it got removed. There's only one problem. There's no evidence for it. There is no textual evidence suggesting it anywhere. No, the only one spoken of in the text is Joshua. Look at this. So you have Joshua the high priest, and you put a crown on his head and tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two, apparently meaning kingship and priesthood. So, so look at this. Here is a high priest who sits on a throne like a king, and is given a crown like a king who will rule like a king, but he is a priest. And his name outside of Ezra and Nehemiah in Hebrew is 
Jesus, again, just for your information, he is said to be a sign of the branch who is the messianic king of the line of David. In other words, this is God saying the Messiah will also be a priest. The Messiah who is a king from the line of David who will rule and reign will also be a priest. And what do priests do? They make atonement for sin and intercede for us before God. So here we have Jeremiah 23 speaking of this king, this royal leader, this new David called the branch. And here Zechariah is telling us this branch will also be a priest. And it's now showing us the two phases of the Messiah's work. First, as a priest, to die for our sins, make atonement, and then to come and rule and reign. But always as a king. Remember when he was born? Who is he that's born? King of the Jews, Herod's question. When he dies, what does it say? This is Yeshua of Nazareth, king of the Jews. He's born a king, dies a king, but he is a priestly king. And that's why he first suffers and then comes to rule and reign. And in doing this, he is fitting the same pattern as the prophecies of the return of exile. Already and not yet. The first part happened as scheduled. The rest was delayed and will happen at the end. It is exactly the same with the Messiah. The way we interpret messianic prophecy is the way that we interpret scores of prophecies throughout the Bible, even the way that traditional Jews also have to interpret them, already and not yet. What we're doing with the Messiah is completely consistent. Hopefully, you see the significance of what I said. If not, a day from now, a week from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, the light will go on. Just like getting a joke long after you heard it, the light will go on and you'll say, oh, now I see it. So hopefully it'll sink in. You'll get the significance of it. If it's not sinking in, it's not because you're spiritually dull. It's because I'm trying to cram a lot in in a short period of time and hopefully did it with some clarity. Meditate on these things and you'll see the significance and importance of them. Amen? Let's pray. Abba, we ask you for eyes to see and hearts to understand. And we ask you for the opening of hearts, the opening of minds, the changing of lives with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. May many turn to you in these days, the high holy days. May many of our people turn and find salvation and forgiveness in your son. We ask it in his name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.